getting your petition signed. So the nice thing about recalls is that unlike uh, ballot access petitions, there's no. Yeah. I was just wondering, but you're probably going to answer it actually now. But I was just wondering, there's a limit to how many petitions can be circulated. Um, yes, I'm going to get to that in just one minute, actually. Um, who can sign your petitions? Any Colorado resident um, and U.S. citizen over the age of 18 who's a registered elector in Colorado. Um, if you've done this before for partisan races, you know, it has to be a member of the party and that's something that always trips people up in this process. Not true for recall, uh, for recall petitions. It just has to be someone within the district that you're conducting the recall for. Um, like I was just emphasizing, petition packets circulated by one person, only one, and then you can hand it back in, get another one, get those notarized. Um, nobody ever follows this rule, but this is a very legally contentious process, so just do it. You're technically required to wear a name tag, identifying yourself as either a volunteer or a paid circulator. Uh, so, you know, as your effort gets off the ground, just spend a wee amount of money, just print it on like some Avery name tags. You know, recall for so-and-so, paid circulator. Recall for so-and-so, volunteer circulator. Um, yeah. I have never heard of petitions getting disqualified for this, but it is in the law and there will be lawsuits around any recall efforts. So just don't give them anything. Wear your name tag when you're out there getting, uh, getting circulators. If you are in a position to pay people to gather signatures, this is an important rule. Paid circulators cannot have more than 20% of their total compensation arise from commissions or bounties. So you can't hire people and be like, we'll give you five bucks for every signature you'll get. Um, if, if that's their entire compensation, that isn't going to fly. If you say, oh, we'll pay you $50 an hour and then five bucks for every signature you get or something, you know, you can work that out. But the way that we typically do this is instead of paying per signature, create some sort of goal and then bonus structure. So you say, oh, okay, we're going to pay you 20 bucks an hour. If you hit your goal for the day, we'll give you, you know, like a $10 bonus or something like that. Um, but the important thing is that 20% threshold. I want to even put it here again, never take apart petition packets. That is vitally important. Um, <clears throat> continuing on this, um, any person who's eligible to vote in the district uh, can sign them. When you get, when you see your packets, the thing, there's a couple of things that it's going to ask for. And basically, the Secretary of State or the clerk just needs to verify that the person signing the petition matches the voter file. So they need to list the address, and this is important, the address where they're registered to vote not where they happen to live now, the address where they're registered to vote on the voter file. So say, you know, say I move and I forget to update my voter registration, I need to put my old address down, and it still needs to be in the district, by the way, or it won't count. When the Secretary of State goes to validate that, they'll say, oh, okay, well, here's Ben Ingen, um, but that's weird, he's, at the, he's not at this address. So that signature won't count. It has to be the address that they have. Electors can only sign one petition per, per elected official being recalled. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more at the end, but what this means is that if everyone is just overcome with enthusiasm at the end of this, runs out, everybody pulls petitions to recall Carrie Donovan, now we have six petitions all against Carrie, a person can only sign one. So if whoever gets to me first, I sign their petition, and someone else comes to me, maybe I sign theirs. Whoever turns that petition in first, is the only person who gets credit for my signature. Anyone else who has my signature, it's not gonna count for them. And so what will end up happening is we'll all end up overlapping each other, a bunch of signatures will get disqualified, no one will get over the threshold. That's why it's important to have one unified effort. Yes? Um, oh, just to clarify basics, elector is the same as a voter? Yes, sorry, and you elector is the legal term for registered voter. Okay. Good question. Um, signatures may only be gathered within the 60-day window following approval of the format. So once the Secretary of State sends you your petitions and says, all right, these are good for you to print, you have 60 days. And they'll tell you what the cutoff is, and in fact, they'll post it publicly um, on that webpage that I showed you, and they'll say, all right, you have to get these back to us by then. Anything gathered before or after that does not count. you got 60 days to get everything done uh, that you need to do. I have never heard of things being disqualified for this, but it is in the law that you have to use black ink. Use black ink. Sorry, yes. <laughs> the 60 days is for a human recall or like an electoral? That's for a, that's for a recall of a person. Person. 
electoral, this like electoral a, like is the different. EPD. Yeah, yeah, that's different. I okay. Don't, I don't know what it actually. Well, it might be the same. I don't know off the top of my head. I have to double check. Okay. That. Um, but this is this is all regards to people, right? People. Here. Okay. Um, so what was I saying? So anyway, yes, use black ink. Again, if, if you happen to not, it will probably be okay. I've never heard of it disqualifying something, but it is the rule. So be sure and do that. No, it's only sixty days because it takes. It took me like a week to get my packet for the. the um, it's it's from <laughs> so like that sixty days starts when those petitions were approved. So when Rose like got the approval so for those, the, the clock right? started. The clock started. It has nothing to do with what you're doing. It has everything to do with what the Secretary of State does. Okay. So once they started that She's clock, that. that's running. Um, so I forget when they got this. So you guys are even actually probably almost halfway through. Actually, the petition for the Electoral College is six months. Oh that's yeah, that's, that is right, because you guys have to get more. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, other things, and you guys probably, since you're circulating this already, you've probably encountered this a ton. Among the things it asks a circulator for is the county, not the state. Everyone writes Colorado in the county. <laughs> Those signatures won't be valid. You need to watch people as they're signing and remind them. Put the address where you're registered to vote. Put the county that you live in, not Colorado, where it says county. <laughs> a lot of people in this county have P.O. boxes where they get their mail. And that, is it where you physically live? Or where it's you where you physically mail? live. Any P.O. box will not count. Okay. Yes, it's where, it's where you physically reside and are registered to vote. No P.O. boxes, great question. You need your both though. Mm, don't well. Oh. I, yes, you, you can. Like, oh, no. So, <laughs> so if they if they do, as long as they have, so the Secretary of State has to interpret these liberally. There's a court directive saying you if can you can them. reasonably look at it and be like, okay, yeah, this is probably the person who signed it. They have to count those, but they won't. If you want them to actually count those, then you have to sue them. So, oh, in the interest of avoiding that, make sure everything is pristine. If you do turn in your petitions and you come up short, you'll have to file a lawsuit to get things like PO boxes wow. uh, and stuff like that counted, uh, or your like states <laughs> instead of counties and stuff. Um, and that's just a huge hassle. Uh, an election lawyer will charge you just to file that lawsuit thirty grand. Oh, gosh. Did you have a question? I do have a question about the window. Yeah. So is that for like every individual petition, like one, or is this? It's for the effort as a whole. Okay. So once the organizer gets that email from the Secretary of State. The clock, the clock starts. Submitting petitions. They have to all be submitted at once. Anything you submit, like you can't be like, okay, here's our first batch, I'll be back tomorrow with the second one. Nope, whatever you gave them in that first batch, that is what they're going with. You have to gather all of those things up and turn them in. I actually just learned this in preparation for this presentation. You must also submit a list of all of the people who circulated the petition as well as all of the notaries who notarized your petitions. So you need to have the name, address, and phone number of every single person who handed you back a packet that you're going to turn in. You also need to have the records of the notaries who notarized each one of those packets. Now this will not, if you don't do this, it won't disqualify your petitions, but what does happen is the Secretary of the State or the clerk will create that list themselves just by going through and looking, and they are within their rights to bill you for the cost and time that it took them to do that. And if you have a vindictive election <laughs> official, who knows what that could be. Uh, they have to review those promptly. They basically have, they have 15 days to get those back to you. Um, if any of you recall in 13, we actually went quite a bit faster than that just because there was so much hype around the recalls that that actually got done pretty quickly. But at most, they have 15 business days to either say, all right, you made it, or no, you didn't. And this is, this is a kind of interesting fact over here. If your petition is insufficient, if you don't have enough signatures to make the cut, you can withdraw the petition from consideration and take an extra 15 days, 15 actual days, not business days, to get additional signatures. You can do that one time. However, that's what the law says. The Secretary of State's office has subsequently issued a rule saying that they won't allow you to do that. Oh. So if it, just don't find yourself in this situation. If you're really close, yeah, you might be able to, again, shell out a ton of money to a lawyer and sue to force them to let you do that, because that's what the law says. But the SOS has issued a rule saying that they won't let you do that. So just 
get it right the first time, and I'll talk about that more at the end in the strategy portion, but you do technically have that right. The petition can then be challenged for 15 days, and you better believe every one of your petitions is gonna be challenged. So once they say, I mean, nobody's gonna challenge it, but it doesn't make it, but once they say, all right, it's valid, be guaranteed, whoever you're trying to recall will have their lawyers file some sort of challenge for something. Um, some, well, I'll talk about this as we get into the history of these things. All right, so you got approved. You went out, you got, all right, say we're doing Carrie Donovan again, you got 20,000 signatures, you got over the threshold, you made it, you are good to go. So once those petitions have been approved and that 15-day protest period has passed, an election must be held between 30 and 60 days after that date. Okay. Governor has to say, all right, the election's gonna be uh, on this day. It has to be sometime in a two-month window following that approval. With a couple of, with one caveat, if there is a general election occurring within 90 days of that window, then the recall must be conducted in concert with that. So it gets rolled on to that general election. If the target of the recall resigns before the deadline to make the ballot for the recall, whole thing's, <coughs> whole thing's off, whole thing is canceled. And the way that this works in practice is say you're trying to recall a Democrat and the Democrat resigns, well, the Democrat party just picks a new Democrat to take over, there's no election. And this deadline, which I'll talk about on the subsequent slides, is 15 days prior to the date that the election is set. Now, there's like a lot of dates flying around here. Yes, sir. What if, what if the object of the recall, just for example, is a registered independent? Then, then what happens? Ah, well, that is also a great question. I don't know how independents do it. So the way that they would handle that is a substitute. I actually think that, that goes up to the governor. To report. Well, it depends on the office. But if it's like a general assembly member, I think that would actually fall up to the governor to replace that. Because what happens is the rule that goes into effect is the partisan rule governing vacancies. So the, the vacancy rule is actually like a, like a Colorado state party rule that says, okay, it's, the, uh, it's, the, it's these members of that district, pick a, new, pick a new person. And the Democrats, I think they do it the same way we do. It's these members of that district, pick a new person. If someone's unaffiliated, it becomes just kind of a, it becomes an actual legal vacancy. And my recollection in, is that in Colorado, those end up getting filled by the governor. Yes? And then, like you spoke earlier, that doesn't happen in local elections. There's uh -oh. no appointment to local. No. No. So we can. Well, wait, that so depends on how local you get. Like if you're talking about a county commissioner, commissioner yeah. commissioners work the same way. They'll, yeah. they're, they're governed by the vacancy committee. Right. Um, yeah, so a partisan county official would be replaced by the party members within that county. So that would be like the Demo Republican and Exactcom, however you guys have it set up uh, in Chile. Um, so ideally that doesn't happen to you, but if it's after 15 days, the recall still moves forward because there's no chance for a new candidate to get on the ballot. Um, now, it's just a good old fashioned, typical campaign like you're used to. There's one wee difference in the way that you nominate your candidate. A new candidate has to access the ballot via uh, via the petition process. It's not like when we typically do this, you can go to the assembly or something. They have to petition on. Um, they still have to have been affiliated with the party that they're seeking the nomination from as of the first business day in January preceding that election. So they would have had to be a Republican at the beginning of January of this year if they want to be the candidate to replace someone in a recall that happens this year. I, yes? I'm sorry to beat this is in the bucket like I used to So let's say for the sake of argument that a recall effort is in place for a state senator. Mm -hmm. And that state senator, when it looks like the, the petition process has been successful and that person is going to be the object of a recall and, the go and they resign, the governor then would appoint a replacement? So in the, in the, case, of a, in the case of a state senator, for example, the vacancy committee for that district would appoint a replacement. So, and that's the members of the party that currently represents that district. So in Senate District 5, for example, there's a group of probably 15 Democrats who make up a vacancy committee for that district. So say Carrie Donovan resigns, then those 15 Democrats would get together and pick a new Democrat. The only member of the General Assembly were they to resign that I think the governor would appoint would be Barbara McLaughlin, since I think she's our only well, my unaffiliated. Is, then does that person have to run against 
No. Nope. The whole thing, the whole thing is off. That person is safe. Till the next election. Until the next election. Yeah. And you're gonna tell some horror stories. Oh yeah. So this, I mean, some of you might remember this happened in 13. Remember, they mounted a recall in Arvada against Evie Hudak. Didn't look like she was going to pull it out, so the Democrats basically paid her off. She resigned, and they appointed someone to replace her, and it canceled the whole thing. Now, just as if the recall were successful, that person then has to stand in the next general election, whether that seat was going to be up or not. Um, so they still have to run in, in the next general, but there won't be a recall election. So, so if, uh, if an appointed person go, fills up a, a position because somebody resigned, because he was being petitioned against. Yeah. That appointee cannot, there cannot be another petition to get rid of, to re there, there, Well, no, there can't actually, unfortunately, because then those rules at the beginning kick in again, and that person has to have either been in office for six months or five days in the General Assembly. So they basically buy themselves this grace period. Uh, okay. Yes, crazy stuff. At least it sends a message. Yes. <laughs> but a lot you know, and if you have a like, real personal vendetta against a particular candidate, they're still gone. Mm -hmm. um, like I was saying, so your replacement candidate has to be affiliated since the beginning of the year. Okay, so this is where it's different. Pay attention to this. Um, because this gets complicated. Because say you go out and you get all your petition signatures and they're approved. Now you have to do another petition. You have to do a second petition to get the candidate on the ballot to begin with. Otherwise, you're recalling someone and you don't have a replacement. Like, what's that going to do? Uh, you'll probably just end up with another Democrat or someone. Right. So you have to have a candidate in the wings ready to rock so that once your petitions get approved, then that person needs to go out and get the lesser of 1,000 signatures or 30% of the votes cast in the last primary election. Uh, so in most cases, this will end up being 1,000 signatures. So it's a much lower bar, but you still got to go out and do that. And you have to do that before 15 days out from when the election is set. So say the governor, for some reason, is not super keen about your recall effort and says, all right, your petitions have been approved. You have 30 days until the election. You basically have, you have 15 days. You have just over two weeks to get those thousand signatures, get your person on the ballot, mount a campaign in the subsequent two weeks, and get them chosen in the recall <laughs> election. It's a big lift. <laughs> so bear that in mind, that's why you know, before you go to the trouble of spending, investing your time, money, and resources in mounting a recall, it might be a good idea to make sure you have someone who can actually win an election <laughs> who's ready to pull the trigger on that. Uh, county candidates, it's a different threshold. You need 20% of the votes cast in the last primary for that seat to access the ballot. They don't have that lower threshold, so it's a little bit harder in some cases for, uh, for county candidates to make the ballot. It's still um, 15 days. Well, it depends. It's 15 days from when the election is set. So you could have as many as 45 days, or you could have as few as 15 days. It depends on when the governor sets the election. Um, so then, that, uh, yeah. when you talk about 20% of those votes cast in the last primary, what does that mean? So that's, uh, so the last time, well, this is where it gets a little tricky. So for county candidates, uh, say there was a primary election for, uh, for that candidate. It's, however, it's 20% of the total votes that were cast there. If there was not a primary, it defaults to the last general, and that is a much higher threshold. So it all kind of depends on the so precise seat. It's in the, the primary election of the party that that, that, that elected official is Yes, in. yes. Okay. So that would be like, that would be our Republican primary for, you know, for that commissioner of District 1. Well, we're not recalling any Republicans here, but in this case, it would be the 20% uh, of the Democrat primary. And if there wasn't, then it defaults back to... Then it goes back to the general. Okay. Uh, I, I can see you that. Actually, that exact breakdown is in the text here, I believe, uh, which you'll be able to read when I post this. Um, so in, unlike the prior petition that I just mentioned, in this case, signers do have to be members of the party of the candidate. So if you're nominating a Republican candidate, only Republicans can sign that petition to get the candidate on the ballot. So anyone can sign a recall petition, only members of the party can sign a ballot access petition. Yes? What if, mm -hmm. what if the person being recalled is an independent? Because independents have the ability to, to primary in either party. So that, well no, that doesn't work for candidates. So it's the party of the candidate. It doesn't matter the person that you're recalling, it's the party of the candidate. Okay, but there's never a primary for an independent. 
So oh, so you're I'll saying if you're if an independent wants to run to be the replacement candidate? No. Yeah, no. So this this has nothing to do with the person you're recalled. It's who it's the candidate that stands up. So if Rick Shovel decides that he wants to run, then we need those people to be Republican. And and get a thousand and a thousand Republicans have to sign that. It's what? the it's the candidate who is challenging that determines the partisan requirements, not the elected official that you're recalled. But what, what if Rick is an independent? An un unaffiliated. Oh, well, there, that's where it gets that's where it gets complicated. <laughs> unaffiliated. I have to I have to look at that. Unaffiliated require it's the same thing, but I think you actually need you need more signatures. I think, uh, but it's not dramatic. It's not dramatic anymore. Actually, let me just see if I wrote it down here. <laughs> no, I didn't. I can put that in the version that I post though. But it's the same type of thing. Unaffiliated have to petition on the same way. Now, would, who would be able to sign an unaffiliated candidate petition? Any, anyone can sign an unaffiliated candidate's petition. That's primary, members of the same party. Uh, let's see, I said you have 15 days preceding the election. So the election itself, I've noticed there's a lot, it seems like there's a lot of confusion about this. It isn't two elections, it's one election that actually takes place. And the election basically, like you, you'll be able to see this a little bit better when I post this. The way to look on your ballot is basically two questions. Should we recall X elected official? And which successor candidate do you like? So oh. first, the first question has to pass by a majority. Most people have to say, yes, we sh should recall so-and-so. If that question gets more than 50% of the votes, then the candidate who ends up replacing that person is the candidate who gets the most votes. It's a plurality. You don't have to get a majority amongst the candidates, but you do have to get a majority for the recall question. So those two things happen at the same time. Wow. Uh, and well, I'll go into this when I talk about lawsuits. Uh, but you don't, you can vote no here and still vote for a candidate here, and your vote will count for both. Uh, weirdly. Oh, and the incumbent cannot run to be one of the replacements. I mean, the incumbent is technically already on the ballot as part of this first question. They can't then go out and get petitions and nominate themselves to be the successor. They're precluded from that since they're being recalled. Okay. I'm sure this is where most of the questions are. So questions about the actual process before I go into how this has kind of worked in the past. <sighs> yes. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know, I know it's a lot of information. <laughs> it's very confusing. <laughs> So if we want to recall a Democrat, do we have to replace them with a Democrat? No. No, okay. That's whoever, the, yeah. the replacement will be whoever gets the most votes, uh, the most votes in this election. Okay, and there's two spaces there. Does one of them have to be? Oh, it's the, oh. oh that's just. Yeah, so this character. is just, what did I use? I used the 13 questions, for example. Here. So this is recall Angela, yes, no, go, boom, boom, boom. Who do you want to replace her? George Rivera, Richard Anglin, or it's most, obviously it's Rivera. You want Okay. And so, the independents can sign for a Republican nominated candidate. They cannot sign to nominate the Republican. They can sign to not recall. Not to nominate, but like someone. they can sign for the recall. Yes. But if you put forth a Republican candidate, you can only sign Republican people on that candidate. On their petition. Right. So then but what then happens anyone to the can independents? Vote for what happens to the independents? So it's it's the so it's the same thing I was saying. They have it's the same thing. Independents can get signatures from anyone, but they have a slightly higher uh, threshold. If I recall correctly. But because they can get them from anyone, that would be an easier way to count their. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we we recall Donovan. We have a Republican candidate to run. Can the Democrats get petitions? So they so it could be a yes. horse race. And this is and this is one of the things that they screwed up in thirteen. Um, which actually I'll, I'm going to talk about that right okay. now. So yeah. So you can't have been a Republican in January and then decide to switch to become an independent and then run on the recall ticket. Um, well, the independents have different. Well, no, actually, the independents cut off is, is the same. Okay. Um, so you have to be uh, you have to be affiliated with whatever you are since January. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Everyone that requests a petition to circulate even if it's the same one that like this um, one that being passed uh, yeah, yeah. national party yeah, yeah. <clears throat> anyone who requests one of those positions uh, petitions has to 
submit the 200 words or less? No. Yeah, that person, the person who gets them, uh, who gets them approved by the Secretary of State has to submit that. So there's like one point person for the recall. So for like these NPB things, no. it's Rose Puglisi from Mesa County. So she went to the Secretary of State, she got her petitions approved, they sent them to Rose, and then she handed them out to you ladies. So like you, you don't have to worry about any of the requirements. Rose, as the organizer of that petition drive, is the one who had to submit the statement, get the format approved, print them off, give them to you lasses. So I'm going to recount the tale of the 2013 recalls, which will hopefully kind of help clarify some of this. Was anyone here, I mean, I know it's down the road, but was anyone here involved in either of those recalls, um, organizing, getting signatures or anything? Oh, good. So this will all be new information. So as confusing as this is and as impossible as the hurdles are, we have done this before successfully, twice in one year. Uh, despite what everyone said, oh no, it can't be done, it actually got done. <laughs> but there are a couple of myths that surround uh, those petition processes in 2013. Though. One, they, they weren't actually as successful as we make them out to be. Uh, we, there were actually four that were originally launched, and only two of them ended up getting sufficient signatures uh, to actually move forward. And while there was a lot of grassroots enthusiasm and a lot of volunteer support, uh, they were also of a lot of outside money uh, to help pay to gather those signatures. Um, the, I'm gonna, there were the two that were ultimately successful, the one in Pueblo and the one in El Paso. The one in El Paso was the Morris recall, uh, which I'm gonna kind of focus on as my example here. Uh, they spent $80,000 on signature gathering, which is actually uh, a screaming deal. I mean, like I said, a typical gubernatorial campaign will spend 200,000 to get their 20,000 or so signatures. These guys got, so that's a testament to how strong volunteer effort was, but they still spent a lot of money going out and getting those signatures. What's in that 80? Human pay, gas that's all, mileage, that's all. food, So this is, this is total spending, so that's like freaking everything. But okay. of this 80, I want to say in the high 60s of it, was actually paying individuals to go and get the petitions. Oh, wow. And basically all of that came from... Uh, some of you probably know or have heard of Laura Carno. Basically, all of that came from her organization, uh, who kind of came in and helped them along uh, to get that done. But you can see they really crushed it because they only needed 7,000 signatures in that case, and they got 16,000. Uh, the guys down in Pueblo, they, I mean, I got to say, they actually had a really good operation. They gathered 13,000 of the 11,000 signatures that they need, and they still made it. They had one of the best validation rates for their signatures of, uh, I, think, I think Tom Tancredo did better in 14, but they had one of the best in Colorado history. And one of the things that they did was they, I mean, they used technology. So right there when they would go and say, hey, sign my petition, they would pull up that person's voter record and say, here is what is on your voter record. This is what I need you to put on the form. So they checked it in real time as they were getting signatures. So they'd have to give you give them their DOV or their date of birth. Yeah, so you can do that, or you can just purchase the voter files like a thousand bucks, and then you can just load everyone. Uh, so you can look by it. name; you don't have to divulge your date of birth. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and it's like I said, it's only a thousand bucks. You can thank Scott Gessler for that. Um, but uh, if you want to just go to the Secretary of State's webpage, which might, which might be a cheaper, easier option for you, you can totally do it that way too. Well, Ben, is that the same list you're talking about of all the registered voters in the county? Uh, that's actually everyone in the state. If you just go get the county, what is it here? It's probably like 50 bucks. Uh, it's actually free, so oh. I get one every year. Boom, there you go. <laughs> Even better. Um, so basically, you all recall what happened. Um, there was a lot of pushback against the, uh, the Second Amendment, the anti-Second Amendment legislation that year. A couple of grassroots groups, you know, folks who hadn't really previously been involved are the ones who got these things off the ground. Um, and it was only after it, it started to look like they were catching some momentum and all the kind of establishment folks took an interest uh, and came in and backed them up with some support. Um, and those two efforts did turn in enough. Now, no one had ever succeeded in conducting a recall in Colorado. So people were going crazy. No one even really understood the rules, not even the clerks or the secretary of state or the governor or anyone. And this was actually a big reason that we were successful in those recalls in 2013. We're not going to be able to count on that this year because all of these questions were settled by the courts in 2013, and luckily most of them broke our way. Um, 
right off the bat, Morse challenged his petitions. If you know how I was mentioning, once you turn in your recall petitions, there's a 15 day window in which someone can challenge them. So Morse hired a bunch of lawyers, challenged them immediately. And he actually had a pretty compelling case because the circulators for those petitions did not use the exact precise language prescribed by the Constitution. And it wasn't that different. You know, it was just a couple of words were different. And he could have gotten every single one of those signatures thrown out. That's why it's so important that you don't make any changes at all to what the Secretary of State or the clerk gives you on your petitions. Because you can go out and get 100,000 signatures for MPV or go out and get 27,000 signatures to say, like, recall Kerry Donovan. And if you have changed something in there, they could all be for nothing. So they, they brought a lawsuit, challenged those petitions, um, and luckily what had happened was the Secretary of State's office had approved those petitions, so they hadn't changed anything, but the Secretary of State approved them different than what the Constitution said. So it actually held up because they didn't make any changes on their own. It would still be government-approved uh, language, so their, their petitions were able to stand. Then the next bit of craziness, while well, this was all going on, you may remember, is Hickenlooper wouldn't set a date for the elections. And the explanation for that was, well, there's all of this craziness, no one even knows if any of these things are gonna stand, so I'm just gonna stand pat and wait this out. So uh, Scott Gessler, who was the Secretary of State at the time, actually had to sue Hickenlooper to force him to set a date to even have the recall election. Wow. Then, <laughs> because of that, and this actually goes to kind of uh, what we were talking about earlier with uh, not with uh, third parties or unaffiliated. The Libertarian Party then had to sue again to clarify the timeline for candidate petitions because there were basically two, there was a conflict between law and, and the Constitution. So Libertarians were told, oh, okay, you have until 10 days before the election to get your petitions in one place, and then in another place, oh, you have 15 days before the election. And this Libertarian Party lawsuit is actually the thing that really cinched victory for us in those 2013 recalls. Because the confusion surrounding this meant that the clerks who were conducting those elections didn't have time to do a mail-in ballot. So it was like it was in the old days, you actually had to show up to the polls and vote. So only folks who were very invested in the recall showed up and voted, obviously. And that is really the thing that, that made us successful in 2013 was that the Libertarians just happened to issue, uh, issue that lawsuit. Um, then I alluded to this earlier, this was less relevant to other things, but the Supreme Court also had to weigh in and say, all right, can you vote for a replacement candidate if you didn't vote for the recall? So you could say, oh no, I don't want anyone to be recalled, but I vote for this guy if they are. Um, they were, there was a question about whether those votes should count. The Supreme Court ultimately ruled that, yes, they should count. So the Colorado Supreme Court. Yes, that was the Colorado Supreme Court. Um, the other thing that helped us in 2013, only Republicans, uh, had enough signatures to actually get on the ballot in those two races. So if you were able to see those questions that I showed you there, you know, the once the recalls passed, the outcome for the Republicans was overwhelming. It was like 15,000 votes, you know, for Rivera, and then 200 for some Libertarian. So this was a huge mistake on the part of the Democrats in 2013. They basically went all in on defending the person who the recall was being run against, and they never thought to maybe put another Democrat in in case things went poorly. Yeah. You know, because in, in Pueblo especially, a lot of those folks were Democrats who voted. So it wasn't necessarily that they were anti-Democrat, it's just that they were pro-Second Amendment. So had the Democrats mounted a candidate, they might have been able to hold on to the seat via the replacement. So yeah. this is another area where we really walked out in 2013, and it's assuming they have learned their lesson there. Um, we probably can't bank on them on them doing that again. There will likely be Democrat replacement <laughs> candidates uh, in our recalls this year. Despite all of that, we were outspent three million dollars to five hundred thousand. Wow. wow. So in that topic, though, going back to what you just said about the Democrat replacement, doesn't that split the vote? Uh, no, because the recall the question and the replacement the question are independent. Okay. So all the Democrats could go, oh no, on the recall, but then they could still come down and vote for this Democrat guy. Um, and, if the recall and, does happen, then. Yeah, and say maybe you have a bunch of like writing candidates or Libertarian Party candidates, because you can more to lose down below. Okay. So 
you know, it's, it's basically, at that point, it's just like a normal election. Okay, so the top question kind of goes away and becomes the second. Yeah, question. once that passes, okay. it's kind of its own thing. Um, so like I was saying, Democrats spent $3 million to hold on to those seats versus about 500000 spent on the Republican side. And we're still victorious. And in two seats that are heavily, heavily Democrat. So, I mean, yes, it's confusing, it's a huge lift. But, you know, if you have the momentum on your side, you can achieve results like that. Um, and one of the reasons that this kind of happened was early polling favored the Democrats so strongly. I, I might have put one in here. Um, every poll that was done said, oh, the Democrats are going to win. And they're going to walk away with it because no pollster had ever dealt with this situation before. So no one knew how to even conduct an accurate poll on this. So that's why everyone was so confounded with the results. Support our Republican candidates for the replacement, uh, even though we're the only candidates. What's the timeline for phones and like a week before the election? So you want, that, you want to start this as soon as possible. So as soon as you have a candidate, you need to you actually, you know, like you know, as soon as your petitions get approved, you need to start calling and going door to door and saying, hey, there's going to be a recall election. Vote oh, yes, here's why, X, Y, Z. Um, candidates installed by recall must stand again in the next election, and that's when those seats flip back on us. So in the case of the state senate, you know, those guys come up every other election, but even if they're not supposed to come up in the subsequent year, if you were put in by vacancy committee or recall or anything other than that traditional election, you have to stand in the next election, even if it isn't time for that seat to be up. Um, one of the other interesting things about those recalls, I mean, I've got reading for these, but this is just an example of a direct mail that we did against John Morse. Um, they ended up not really focusing on the Second Amendment stuff anymore. I mean, that was what got the recall going, but the senators that we recalled just had such high negatives against them uh, that that was what they ended up running the campaign on. You know, like, so these uh, mailers for here, here for John Morse came to light that he had been charging the state per diem for every single day of the year, whether he's working or not. So, and he had it in his official calendar. He it and he told the taxpayers for his per diem. Um, so that was a pretty great one. They ended up, like, the state ended up doubling his legislative salary, actually gave him like 40 grand um, that he just made off with. So those turned into some really good mailers, and that's part of the reason that, that was ultimately uh, successful. Uh, questions about the history. That's just kind of the, the background of how it's been done before. And now we're gonna go and do best practices in the strategic considerations for going forward. I have a question yeah. before we move ahead. Um, and it's actually, I think, the like fourth or fifth slide that I'm going to get to in strategy here. So we will go over that ad nauseum. Um, as I was alluding to, uh, recalls are uniquely powerful because they change the dynamic of the electorate. You know, people are generally aware of midterm elections. They're very aware of presidential elections. Everyone shows up and votes in those. They aren't as aware of, you know, a special election like a recall that just comes out of nowhere and blindsides. That was one of the things that really helped us in 2013. And we aren't going to be able to count on all of those advantages again. So we have to be extra cognizant of timing and executing things in a way that will preserve that power. So like what you're looking at here is the difference between the electoral mix in a midterm and in the recall. So this is Senate District 11. In a typical midterm for a Republican to win Senate District 11, they would have to get 65% of the unaffiliated to break their way. I mean, that's huge. Republicans in metro areas are never gonna be able to do that. But in the recall in 2013, a Republican would have only had to get 46.3% of the unaffiliated to break their way. And that is supremely doable. That's like right on the cusp of what Republicans do in metro areas without really trying. So the fact that people weren't as aware of this election and that there was a differential in the motivation made a big difference. You can see this red slice here is the typical amount of uh, percentage of Republicans who would vote in that race. And then look what it was in the recall. Huge shift at the expense of the unaffiliated who tend to lean left anyway. So it's changing this makeup of the electorate that allows us to be successful in recall and for Republicans to carry seats that traditionally would not break our way, or in the case of you know these seats at 13, that we would have never been able to hold. So as you're moving through this, that's kind of that's the thing you want to keep in mind is what you're really trying to achieve is this reweighting of the electorate. And there's a, some points I'm going to give here about timing 
to make that happen. Getting started, do set up an issue committee to accept donations for your effort. This is a real easy thing to do. The Secretary of State's page, I mean, they have an online form, just go on, it's gonna create an issue committee, boop, boop, boop. It's done. You can take that down to the bank, set up a bank account, and then you can start collecting donations. Yes. And how many of those could be set up for any <clears throat> one recall? For example, Terry Donald on his five or six counties. If you set up one in Chafee and somebody sets one up in Delta, do we have a problem? Um, well, it's not ideal, <coughs> but it's not necessarily committees, not political party committees. Uh, and issued committees are very loosely governed. Um, this table, you may be able to see when I post this basically shows that you can take unlimited money from just about anyone, um, except for candidates, other uh, independent expenditure committees, um, political committees, or small donor committees. Yeah, so, including including uh, businesses? Yeah, a business, so this just happened up in Weld. Uh, that Weld recall that just started, the whole reason they kicked off right now is because they had a business cut a hundred grand check to get them started. Oh. Um, so because you can coordinate in an unlimited fashion if you're both uh, if you're both um, issue. issue committees or independent expenditure committees or really anything other than candidate committees, um, if say you did have two committees like a Delta and Chafee one, you guys could transfer money back and forth and kind of coordinate. But I mean that's going to be a huge pain. So you want to try and avoid having that happen. Ideally, you want one committee. That committee gets the petitions, and then they kind of run the show. Um, from one account. Yeah, from one account. And as I was saying too. I mean, these are contentious issues, and recalls still do have some unsettled questions around them. So you should expect that your committee will get sued, uh, especially if you're successful. There will be a lawsuit brought against you, and it's real easy to like tear people apart for screwing this stuff up. So do set up a committee, but then <laughs> make sure you have rigorous checks and balances within the organization on spending. Make sure you have people involved who understand campaign finance. Hire or recruit someone who has been a treasurer for a campaign or issue committee in Colorado to be your treasurer. And also, retain a chair for this committee that people know and trust. You will be a lot more likely to give you donations if, say, your petition effort is being run by Rose, who everyone knows already, than just Joe Blow that no one's ever heard of. Um, that isn't essential, but it will help you get money and hopefully keep you from losing it losing a ton in subsequent lawsuits. So do set up a committee. Once you have a committee set up, they can write you checks. You can, actually I'll go over that in a subsequent slide. Um, you can raise it online, etc. like via your webpage. And a webpage for something like this is really just a portal for people to give money. You guys probably heard this, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Don't go overboard with your webpage. Set up a webpage, set up a Facebook page, You know, set up an email address, tied that page so it looks uh, so it looks nice, it looks official, but really this is just a portal for donations and what you want to use is um, a platform called Anodyne to raise to raise your money. It's, it's just a wee bit more expensive than using something like PayPal. Um, it's a lot more expensive than whatever the, a lot less expensive than whatever the polis guys decide to use for some reason. Um, but it has a really good clean user experience. Uh, if you've ever given to a candidate, um, GOP candidates will always use Anodyne. Um, it integrates real nicely with your web page, and the whole thrust of your web page should basically be like, click here to donate. I mean, that should be really the only thing on the web page. Go to the web page, click here, give money. Uh, don't worry about constantly updating it. Just like slap your Facebook feed up on there so you can so people can see what events are happening, what's going on. You can just update Facebook; it'll come up everywhere. Um, but do make sure it looks professional. You know, make sure you have. Again, this is why you want to have a good treasure. Make sure you have your required disclaimers on there. Um, which isn't complicated, it's one sentence. Just paid for by X, not authorized by any candidate. It's actually the federal language, but that's safer. Um, just very simple web page, drive people to your donations. That's what you want that for. I find it difficult to differentiate which ones are real and which ones not. Uh, there's a recall polis and there's a uh, resist polis. And then you and me both. I don't know how to help you. Okay, which one is real? This is like, I mean, this is the thing. So, I mean, if you actually are questioning it, one of the easiest things to do is you can go to the Secretary of State webpage, go to Elections Campaign Finance, and you can see the committees that are registered for that. Okay. Um, and you want to make sure that the committee you're giving to is the committee that's approved that. I mean, there are already, there are three separate committees up in House District 50 trying to do this recall. Only one of them has any money. Only one of them actually has petitions. 
But now, like these other guys, they're just sowing confusion. So for the love of God, people work together. <laughs> and you don't have to have the name of the committee perfect. You can just put polis in, and all those committees will pop up. So you don't have to go and find out what five committees there are. You literally, and Polis's governor campaign will be up as well. So you just count that and just find the ones that are the governor's ball. Uh, th this may be a wee bit esoteric. With the Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one thing, like, if you're a person setting up a committee, like you're in Shady County, a uh, thing that you can do for adults, you know, is, is invest like two or five bucks a day in Google search ads. So that when people do search for the recall effort for whatever candidate, your page is the one that comes up at the top, not whatever some other rogue person did. Just, I mean, that's something you can do to kind of protect yourself against that if you're the official committee. Um, but yeah, that is a point of confusion. Try not, y'all try not to get yourself in that trap that they're in up in Weld. Um, granted, they're well-funded already, so they'll probably still be successful, but that's gonna hurt them because people are giving money now to organizations that aren't gonna do anything with it. Um, you know, just, who knows, it's just in the wind. Um, this question has come up a lot, uh, kind of amongst the Republicans, about how involved the Republican Party uh, can be or should be. Um, and now at the state level, kind of the, the way that this used to work is the state party would get involved after petitions were accepted. So like in 2013, that's when the state party really got involved, and they contributed money and resources to help get that done. Uh, in county situations, you know, the county parties can make that determination. But, but the reality is, like, there's an infinite number of candidates that can be recalled. I mean, the Republican Party doesn't have the resources to be going around handing out money to recall every single person under the sun. You know, and it's, it's too tough a call to figure out which ones are gonna take off, which ones aren't. So generally, the state, and in most cases, county parties, just avoid that whole thing. Um, even if they aren't formally engaged in it, there's a couple of things they can do to help you. Um, like they'll have access to the voter file, um, they can give you access to that. Um, the state party does have a walk app that they would probably let you use. Yes? And it's different this time around because I think Republicans learned a lesson and get behind it earlier now because Ken Buck, who just, who just voted as a party chair, one of the first things he said is he'd be for a recall. And he's already reached out to a lot of people in our Senate district to uh, yeah. so, on the recall. So you guys are in a good situation here because you're in one of the two, two or three Senate districts that actually makes sense to launch recalls in. So they might decide to get involved earlier. Um, but you know, even you know, even if you're somewhere doing something that they don't really care about, they'll still give you access to the voter file, the walk app, you know, give you Can some you define the walk like app? Uh, so it's, I mean, it's basically just a little, uh, it's an application for your phone. They'll load up a list of potential voters in there. You can open it on your phone and it'll say, go to this house, there's a person here, this is their voter file information, ask them if they want to sign, you can put it in there. So it's just a, a way for you to look up that voter registration Got information uh, that I hope you're doing. Um, now, if your petitions are successful, you do initiate a recall, uh, the state party will almost always find money uh, to support you, and especially if it's against Kerry Donovan. They will. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, don't forget a candidate. <laughs> as all this is going on, Ideally, you would have someone who is agreed to go out and get the petitions, put their name in the ring, be a candidate, so that by the time you've gathered your 20,000 signatures and turn them in, you know who the person is going to be. And there's no reason that person can't be involved in helping get that first batch of signatures either to kind of help their campaign along uh, in the long run either. Uh, in fact, that would be ideal. And in fact, you, you really probably want to make sure you have this locked down before you submit your petitions for approval. Because like I was saying, once you do that, that 60 day clock, clock starts, you can't be figuring out all the logistics when you have to go and get 20,000 signatures in two months. So like, you gotta focus on that at that time. Uh, managing your petitions. <clears throat> Keep the meticulous records. It is extremely challenging to go out and get the number of petitions that you're going to need to get. I mean, right off the bat, it's gonna get approved. People are going to be banging your door down to get petitions. Everyone's going to be excited to go out there and get them signed. It's going to be tempting to just start handing out packets to people, you know, like with a turn envelope saying, oh, yeah, get that back to me someday. Don't do that. I mean, it is, it is a huge time investment to keep records on this stuff. And so it's really tempting to say, oh, I'll just send it out. If I get it back, I'll get it back. Keep records. You will regret it in the long run if you don't. And keep meticulous records. And you probably can't see this in the back, but this is like an example of a spreadsheet that I would keep. It doesn't have to be complicated. Like what I would normally do is I just set up 
a spreadsheet with three tabs, a tab for every single person who signed the petition, a tab for every single person who circulated the petition, and a tab for every single person who notarized it. And you want to keep meticulous, every single thing that gets written down should ideally just, I mean, you can make a fancy database, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, however you want to do it. But everything that gets written down, you should have electronically, and you should have a copy, because once you give your stuff to the, sec to the Secretary of State, or the clerk, I mean, it's basically there. So you're not going to have, if you have to go back and check something that they say you did wrong, you got to drive out there, get it out of like their custody, and you go back and look through it. So if I get 80 signatures, 40 signature per packet, I need to then document in another spreadsheet, or can I just I take copies? I wouldn't necessarily say that you need to, but the person quarterbacking your recall effort definitely needs to. Can we, could we make copies of it in case we have, no, they have I mean, that's not gonna, so ultimately the thing that you really wanna put here is you need to put every single line and the voter ID for that individual. Because then when you turn it, because one, you need to know if you have enough petitions. Like you can't just go pick up a packet and say, oh, okay, there's 30 in here, there's 30 in here, there's 30 in here, we must be good. You need to actually be keeping account to make sure that you're getting enough valid signatures that they'll actually count when you turn them in. I mean, wow. You can go, you basically have two options. You can get twice as many as you need, or you can take the time to just check them as you go. So like in 2013, that's the reason the guys in Pueblo were so successful, <laughs> is they checked them, not even after the fact, they checked them while people were signing and kept a record of them. And that's why they were able to get s such a small premium over the uh, actual number of signatures they needed. I mean, otherwise, so what did I say for like Carrie? I mean, you need like 17,000 ballots. Like, you can go out and get 40,000 and roll the dice, or you can go through and take the time to check them and maybe get 20, 23,000. You know, what, what's ultimately gonna be easier? This is really hard to do, I, I won't lie. I've done it before on statewide petitions and typed every single one in there. It is a challenge, but if your petitions get shorted, you can literally put this in the Secretary of State's face and say, uh, no, here is every petition packet, every line number, the name that that person entered, uh, the date that they signed it, like the notary who signed it, and their voter ID according to you. Yeah, it counts. So this gives you a real powerful weapon to fight back. Ideally, and if you have this well kept, you can probably even push back without having to shell out 30 grand to an election lawyer to bring suit in court. Because um, the, the Secretary of State's office can be pretty reasonable about this stuff if you can make a strong case and go back and say, hey, you guys screwed up. These 500 signatures should have counted. I have the record. I have the voter ID. I can show you. And the other problem with making photocopies is then you go back and you're like, all right, uh, now I gotta find this guy. And then you're shuffling through boxes and boxes Searchable. of these so that's petitions. not every single person that's collecting signatures, that's just like the main person. Yeah, the main person leading the, whole leading the effort should be taking point on this. Okay. Um, again, do this with voter IDs. The other thing, check packets out and in. Like I said, you should have a tab or a separate section for your circulators. No, all your packets will be numbered. You probably noticed this. Every packet has a number and a page number. You say, all right, I gave this petition to Joe Blow on this date. It's this packet number. And then you can make sure that one, you're getting your signatures back, uh, and two, that everything is ultimately added up. Which means then you're not asking them to turn. So you're you're the person. You're the instigator. You don't want those turned into you the day before they're due because you have to compile all that. So as you're getting signatures, you need to communicate with your hub so that they are getting all of this information marked down. Yeah, so for, for some perspective, keeping this in, in the way I do, um, we did it as we were going and we uh, still took us, by the time we thought we'd gotten all the signatures, uh, we hand typed 20,000 signatures into a spreadsheet and it took us about two, two weeks of business days. So eight hours a day, for 10 days, type all that in. Um, How many people? But I, uh, that was with one, two, three, four, four or five people working on that. Um, wow. But it ended up really saving our asses in that regard. So <laughs> that kind of stuff is like usually when the bigger parties come in and they bring people to help you do that kind of stuff, right? Uh, no, probably probably not. This will still be some, because this will be before your petitions are validated. Um, so I wouldn't bank on having any help with to get their voter ID, would you want to spend that thousand dollars to get the list? Or you can get it from the state, or whoever. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> well, so the state, so you can also get access to that. Like I was saying, even if the state, depending upon the level of engagement the state party uh, picks up in your uh, in your recall effort, they'll almost always give you access to their statewide voter file, 
if you don't like theirs because it is a little clunky, um, you can spend the thousand dollars. But the state party will probably let you use theirs for free, um, and then you can go in and look that up. And, and for that, I mean, you literally you're, you're doing what exactly the secretary said. You're, you're typing in this person's name, looking to make sure a person like that was that address, and then you type in their voter ID. So. As they're signing it, like we did that the other day when the, um, the uh, waitress was signing our position. And we looked her up as she was doing it. All right, so you should still try and keep a record like this. Okay. So this was, again, something really powerful that the uh, guys in Pueblo did. And I'm, I'm blanking on the guy's name, and I feel really bad because he deserves all the credit in the world for this. Um, but when he got the thing off the ground, they actually made a custom app for iPads uh, to allow them to do this. So they didn't have to enter it. So what they would do is they would show up at your door, they'd be like, oh, hey, is Joe Blow here? Oh yeah, you're a registered voter. You wanna sign this petition? The guy would sign it, they would make sure the information was right, and then on the app, they would just tap that that guy signed it. So then they didn't have to go back and enter the information. The app just moved that voter file over and said, all right, this guy signed it. Oh, wow. Where's that app at, generally? Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> we should call that guy up and see what the is. And I'm blanking on his name, which I feel really bad about now. Was, was it McKnight or Knight? Did anyone know that guy? That's not for issue recalls, just for people recalls. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, this would probably be too cumbersome for issue recalls. And the other thing is for an issue recall, they don't validate every signature. They just validate samples. Mm -hmm. So you have to rely a little more on statistics there anyway. Okay. okay. But for these, they will check every signature. Did Mike with help on that? Uh, no, uh, he, no, he came along much later. Um, yeah, I can't remember the fellow's name. <laughs> Huh? I said something you should, we should know. You should find that guy. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, gathering, uh, gathering your petitions. You know, this is I know generic advice, but play to your district. You know, like if you folks are, are out here, uh, it's probably not super feasible to go door to door with the entire county getting <laughs> signatures. You know, you're probably going to want to set up like you're in town, in like high traffic areas. Maybe go to some of the folks who are around here door to door. You know, when you're in suburban areas, it's much more feasible to do that. Um, easy thing you can do, and you guys have done this with uh, with MPV, is you can really get the low hanging fruit by just doing putting up some Facebook events. Say we're gonna have a petition signing party. You know, spend twenty five dollars to promote that event as an ad, so people will see it. They'll come out. Um, even if you do have the option to go door to door in the district you're operating in, high traffic locations are still usually the fastest places. Will you um, get in trouble if you're trying to collect signatures in front of like a uh, Walmart? Yes, you usually will. Which comes to my next point, government buildings cannot turn you away. Uh, so if you have a permission from like the manager of the Walmart or something, yeah, you can totally do that. I mean, corporations are dicey, you know, small businesses you might have a good chance to get in with. Um, but barring that, you know, uh, DMVs, post offices, libraries, stuff like that, um, has have all been used to success. In Just business. to reel this back in for JP County, um, for our local elections meeting for county commissioners, it's going to be much smaller than the numbers that we're talking about here. Yeah, it's like 2,500, right? Yeah, I mean, much yeah. smaller. And then for Carrie Donovan, we got to go by by her district. So again, we're making our, our work much easier than having to do all of this is what, what they did in these two elections. Okay, thank you for so that. So don't <laughs> take a breath. It's you not guys don't have to get hard. the 20,000 signatures against Kerry. Oh, yeah. in Chafee County. Right. Ideally, you'll have some help, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. for commissioners here, uh, it's like I was saying, it's like 20% uh, of the last vote. So I yeah. think in the last year, it was like 10,000 or right. something. So it's going to be like in the two to 3,000 range for signatures you actually have to get out of Chafee <laughs> County. And our biggest well, challenge is the Eagle County. That's one of our biggest problems getting rid of Kerry Donovan. Because Eagle County is a really blue county. And what, what, that's where the majority of the population is. So if that whole county just decides to vote for her to recall, then she might stay in office. What towns, if I may ask, are Eagle County being offered? Eagle, Bell, Avon. Okay. But, but I've talked to the people in Eagle, so all the party from? chairs there, and yeah. they said that Eagle is the town you've got to get, because that's the biggest one in Eagle. Okay. And that's where she's from. So Eagle County is really scared to get on this on board with this movement with us, okay. because they're the biggest target if we lose. Yeah, which actually brings me to what I alluded to. This is the most important consideration. Do not go out half cocked. The reason that we succeeded in 2013 is because those elections could not be conducted as mail in elections. So we can't bank on that this go around, but we can choose when the election happens. So you need to think this through and count backwards in time. Once you turn your petition to have 60 days, 
Once you turn them in for validation, they have 15 days to approve them. After that, the governor has 30 to 60 days to set the election. So you need to think about this. When is the worst time possible for Kerry Donovan to be dealing with this? Do you want to wait and start this in September so that session is back in and it's hard for her to defend maybe? Do you want to try and do this during the holidays when people are distracted and only your supporters are going to return their petitions? Like to start in August, the thing will have to happen in December. People are going to be traveling for Christmas. They're not going to care. They're not going to remember. They're not going to know that there's an election happening because they probably just didn't send a ballot back in a month earlier. Think this through. Don't run out of the room here and go poll petitions. You know, Give this some thought to when you want the election to happen because this is what ultimately determines your success. You can go out and get your petitions validated, approved, initiate the recall, and then get crushed so easily if you don't have a favorable electoral mix. So this is the thing, more than anything, that will determine your success, is choosing when you want to have the election, have it happen on your terms. If you guys have any questions, you can always email or call me, and I will take them on right now as well. Yes? Okay, I get, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but for a recall petition, I can, re I can request a petition to be started and approved by the Secretary of State. I'll state my reason why I want Jonathan to be recalled, and they, may, they can approve it. She could do the same, but if she uses a different reason, she could get that success, a, a, a petition started and approved by the state, but they will be separate petitions and they will not combine yep, together. they will not combine. If two different people request petitions, those are completely separate efforts. You can't fool those signatures. That's so, why I've gone about, I've met with all the county chair, chair or tried to meet with all the county chairs in, all, in our Senate district here in Donovan, because just starting in Lake County or Jason County, you have the same problem. Yes. But like the problem with doing that is trying to find a candidate, first of all, to represent our district. And the biggest problem is trying to get to get a bit to the other it's Eagle County is really the are, biggest one that's here right now. Are you a point person or something? Uh, are, are you a point are you the person? I think I am because I, I haven't heard anybody else doing anything here. Like Chafee County's done the most so, with, 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 Car yeah. with Carrie Donovan, <laughs> really just I would slow your roll with Carrie uh, a week. The reason really, I, I really, give your, really give some thought to this piece with Carrie. And, and that's why I'm thinking that right now. We need, I think my thoughts are is getting her as soon as possible because what Don't they've do just that. done. They're trying to, what they're trying to do, what they, they did the popular vote, the gun law, they did the oil and gas law, and now they're considering teaching preschoolers about anal sex to yes. gay people. Yes. They're keep thinking about giving illegal immigrants. We have the fuel right now. People are pissed off yeah, at so our state to get rid just of them. So look, that's what I think look at what I'm saying happen. with Carrie Donovan. Don't do anything with yeah. Carrie. <laughs> No, whatever, whatever it's good for me to spend five minutes, I can go into a little more depth than what this guy's talking about there. Whenever it's good. <clears throat> yeah. Other question? Yeah. This is totally off the locker, but it's been sitting on my brain for weeks. What's the difference between this instead of going after them legally, spending $500,000 for a good attorney, and suing them for damages for breaking the Constitution of the United States? Well, you probably won't win that lawsuit. <laughs> because it has to go through the Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, think, I mean, just think about the time scale involved for that. I mean, first of all, like that lawsuit would originate in a Denver District Court. How do you think that's going to go? <laughs> <laughs> and, that's yeah. I, that's and, then and then you're in the years of appeals. And it wouldn't be $500,000 to do that. I mean, that would go up to the Supreme Court. It's been millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. We so, can do this in four months. So, we, so recalling our county commissioners, okay? Like that's something that a lot of us are really interested in doing. Yeah. Do we want to try and how would we coincide this special election with that? Or we have two separate I'm, elections? I'm not sure you actually would want to coincide. Okay. You know, like I was thinking when we were talking earlier, it might be better to start sooner with county commissioners. Okay. You know, like with the legislators, they're going to be done. Like they're not going to be able to do any more damage for six months here in another couple of days. So you have time to kind of work with that. I mean, county commissioners. Okay. <laughs> and you know, and, and that's a it's a lower threshold too. So you might, and if you start very quickly, so, uh, so where are we are, like say you started the beginning of May, up May and June, say you did them in July, they could set it for August or September, which was like ASAP, and try and get that into like ideally maybe try and get that to happen in like 
August time frame before everyone's really like back to school and settled. Um, otherwise, you might be moving away. Okay. Uh, but uh, you guys know your county better than I do. So that's this is something you guys have to think about. But I'm telling you, think about it because that's what will determine if you win or lose. Who sets the election date for recall commissions? The governor sets all. So once it once your once your uh, signatures are validated, once it's shown you have enough, the governor will pick the date. He sets all of them, mm -hmm. and except for his own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If it's for the county commissioner seat, he has to set that date too. Yeah, he sets all recall dates, except unless it's a recall against himself. Um, you have to be a registered voter. To, to be a candidate at the beginning of the year, to sign, no, you can you can like literally register and then turn around and sign. What if you change, what if you were a registered voter but you changed your affiliation? Uh, it doesn't matter. So for, for recalls, it, it really doesn't matter. Anyone can sign anything to recalls. We're just gonna have Dave come and spend five minutes with us before everybody gets out the door because he has some pretty important things to talk about. We're Thanks, Ben, don't worry. Oh, no. And who is this guy? Dave That's Williams, Dave. <laughs> he's got the voice, he's the chairman of the Republican Party. <laughs> all, I, all I want to do is... Up here, Dave. What's that? Up here. Do I have to? Yeah. <laughs> all I really want to do is to let everybody know that the exuberance is wonderful. You know, the, the sentiments, people wanting to get involved, there's a danger here to get too excited and want to run out and start doing things tomorrow. This is a very strategic process. So I want to get you up to speed a little bit. The one thing we've got to do is we have got to separate out what you may want to do locally and what's going to happen in SD5. Because those are two totally different animals, way different. At SD5, what I'm hoping that you leave here with tonight is the interest in helping and understand that there are people that are professionals at doing this that are getting involved. The last thing that we need is for somebody to jump in and just go down and start talking to the, so, to the uh, Secretary of State and so forth because boy that will throw a monkey wrench in it. All of a sudden we're going to have like six different petitions going on out there. We want one petition. So let me see the hands of somebody in here who feels they can raise $400,000 and probably put 25,000 signatures in. Anybody here feel like they can coordinate that? All right, where are you gonna find the 400,000? The people are trying to re recall the state representative down in I mean, Wells County, sure. all they did was ask the oil and gas companies because they're the ones that got screwed by her and they gave her $300,000. So all we gotta do is four hundred thousand. All we gotta do is ask the oil industry, oil and gas industry, want to get into the Republican Party, the Rocky Mountain Gun Organization, well, the NRA. Doesn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people that take this on lately that would be glad to give. give There's some. But I think as a person, I think what this question, is, if I'm correcting, mm -hmm. is can you as an individual spend that time, or would you rather have a body that's paid to do that to go? Usually, it's people that get that money are known to the oil and gas people. So, it's not just us. Yeah, it's people that are known, they know who to speak to. Professional, yeah, professional yeah. signature. Exactly. That's where this is going. Why can't, why can't we do both? That's exactly where it's going. All I'm asking people is to be patient here for another week or two because I've had talks with not only the state GOP, but I've had talks with people more at the national level that are interested in getting involved in this. Everybody understand one thing about Carrie Donovan. She's being groomed to be Michael Bennett's successor at some point. There's people there that want to put out that fire while it's still a little fire before it's a big fire. Can you explain who Michael Bennett is? Michael Bennett's a U.S. Senator right now. Okay, She's being groomed to take his place. This is going to attract a lot of attention. So all I'm going to ask here is that everybody be really patient for a couple of weeks yes. and understand <laughs> that there are things in the works that are going to benefit everybody in here in terms of funding, in terms of manpower, in terms of staffing that will help make this go through. And we need guys like Ezekiah to jump on board with us and help with this thing here because 
it, it's going to be a big deal. It's going to it's going to attract national attention, without any doubt. Okay. Sure. I want, to, I want to speak just for a second about local. Can I do that? Okay. The commissioner situation is, is totally different. Commissioner situation has got to be controlled by the people right here, boots on the ground, and honestly, it's doable. There's absolutely nothing there that will stop this group and the other people in this county that are interested in recalling however many people that you think is, is necessary to do. There's some things you got to look out for. There's some people got to sit down and go through the hoops. You've got to have great candidates because people are not only going to say, do you want to recall this person? They're going to want to know who's replacing them. So you have to first convince them that they deserve to be recalled, which I feel like a couple of them do. How yeah. many of you in this room think that our county commissioners deserve to be recalled? Two of them. Two of them. Two of them. <laughs> Three. The second part of that is, do they like the person that's going to replace them? That's going to be the key, and we're working on that right now. So at least one person in the room this evening is looking at that seriously. I'm not, I don't think anybody wants to say anything that causes them to have to go down and file something with the Secretary of State right now saying they're running for office. Okay? Great candidates are out there. They're out there. Because I have never seen any county in my 12 years of being a conservative activist. I have never seen any county in such turmoil as it is right now and pissed off about this red flag bill. Yeah. I've never seen it. Yeah. Never seen it. There's people out there just chomping at the bit saying, who is it? Let's go. Let's roll. So I just, I just want you to separate the two issues right now and let us control what we can control locally and understand there's no one person, there's no one person, honestly, that's gonna walk in an oil gas guy and say, hey, we need $500,000 to do this, including me, including any of the people I run with, but there are people working on this that can do that. Okay, so just be a little bit patient. Here's a guy, it's all you. I got a yeah, question. Okay. Is there something, that, some place the community can go to get information, like the Chaffee County Issues and Politics Facebook page? Well, well, we'll put some things on there, but what I would say right now is we need to take what Ben is doing here that he's putting out in a general sense and then make it very specific, okay? Mm -hmm. For example, if we wanted to, let's say, replace Keith Baker or replace Greg Felt, let's look at the votes. Let's say, what does it take? What candidates are in that district? Let's go down the checklist. Let's talk about the people who are interested in setting together the committees. Let's talk about how much money we're going to have to raise. Let's find somebody that really understands how to do the paperwork in this, and let's get them on board so we're not having to make this up as we go. Okay. Right? So let's take the activism. I'm not saying tamp it down. What I'm saying is a little bit of patience. Keep the enthusiasm. Talk to people that you think may want to be a candidate of this. Let's get somebody that's pretty high profile, very well respected, because we can do this, and we can do this at the county level. And the people that are looking to get involved in this thing, they got all the money and all the people that, 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 they, can, that they can put in on a professional basis, and they're still gonna need a lot of people at the local level to make it work. Okay. For, the county, to the pros. for county commissioner, for instance, you know, we, we've, the two of us have worked on a lot of campaigns in Chaffee County, and I know a few other ones of you have as well. We have run it in a mom and pop type deal. We have had, you know, the woman that has taken all the donations for the church as the treasurer. We've had the secretary. We can no longer do that. The Democrats have come after us in the 20 years that my husband and I have lived in Chaffee County. Most of you know the Skanga family. Bev Skanga had to pay $25,000 of her own money to defend herself against the Democrats to prove she was correct, that she did not make a mistake. So you're saying we need to have a professional treasurer. We need to have a professional treasurer to do this. This is, this is the kind of thing where I'm asking all of you, because I, I've met with almost all of you here in the last uh, four weeks, uh, one way or another. We need to start coming up with names, not only for the candidates, but we need to have uh, probably two right now, 
really trustworthy CPAs to work on these two, and they have to donate their time. We're not going to have money to pay them. We need you on candidate committees. We need you walking door to door. I mean, this is this truly is about to be your grassroots effort that you get involved in. And so it's gonna we're gonna need that for Carrie Donovan. But if we start with these county commissioners, we're already gonna have a base of people that we know we can go to once we get the signatures for them to then take those people into the Donovan race. This so scary because you guys are feeling I'm sure in Shady County, you guys are the reddest county in our Senate district. No, that's, that's not true. Really no, actually, we're purple. Delta is a big county. Yeah. Delta's where you got to get the people on the ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are we going to hear from this young yep. man? Yep. Let's get him. Go ahead. I don't want to get up right now. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Get over yeah. it. Yeah. Get over yeah. it. Yeah. What's your name? My name is Ezekiah Lujan. I'm from Lake County. I'm not anyone important or anything. I pour concrete for a living. I'm poor. You know, I'm not anything you wish me special about. But I appear to be the one, other than Dave and the other chairman in our Senate district, who's leading an effort to get Terry Johnson recalled. I've spoken with Eagle, Lake, Chafee, Pitkin, Delta County, and Gunnison County people. And the biggest issue is Eagle County, trying to get Eagle County on board right now. What I'm trying to do right now is get a meeting to get all this together. Because so far, I've been about the only one who's talked to all the different counties trying to get them together. Because it's still mostly a county, local thing, people trying to get together to do recall. But I'm so eager to get rid of Carrie Donovan and Julie McCluskey, who represents Leadville. She don't represent Chafee, but she represents Lake County and a few, other, a few others of us in Delta and all that. So we're trying to get rid of her too, because if you're gonna try to take out one, you might as well take out both of them, you know? <laughs> so we're trying to do that too, because the way I see it, we have all the fuel we need right now. What the Democrats have gotten away with lately is just pure murder. What, they're, what they've done is just disgusting. And how they've done it is disgusting. So we have the fuel, and all the people I talk to want to do it as soon as possible. But everyone I'm talking to, state leaders like Ken Buck and all the people you know, in the top positions, the people who've done it before, are saying, you know, be patient and be careful because I've got to tell you guys, Democrats are probably going to fight us tooth and nail and spend probably twice, ten times the amount of money they spent the last campaign of 2013 elect recalls because they are, if they lose us and sick Kerry Donovan loses, that's going to send a shockwave, like not only statewide but nationwide, that us in a blue held place, in a blue held state, blue held counties, blue held uh, Senate district were able to kick out a Democrat and replace her. And that will send a shockwave, you know, like I said, to everywhere, everyone else that it can't be done. Mm -hmm. But right now I'm just trying to find, trying to link all the counties together to do this because Chafee County, I think, definitely will vote to have a recall. Lake County, I, I'm hearing from people who don't even talk politics right now that they want to have a recall and have meetings about it. We're trying to make ourselves a Second Amendment sanctuary too. Mm -hmm. And it's, we got, we're pretty positive outlook right now about that. And uh, Eagle County is the biggest most hardest county we're gonna have to deal with because they're a Democrat held county and they're the biggest county in our Senate district and that's where Carrie Donovan's from yeah. and her family's from. So they're gonna fight like hell over in Eagle County and that's where the biggest fight will be. Delta County, Pitkin County, those will be pretty easy. Gunnison County, mm -hmm. we're thinking is gonna be swing because- Jane Cheney is not excited about it. Yeah, they're not, like I said, none of these, the chairman of these Republican, the Republican chairmen of each of these counties is not, that eager about it. you know they're really extremely cautious especially Eagle County like we had it out at the Republican Central Committee da committee down in Denver because a few of us were you know trying to tell them fight you know fight we've got to fight them right now but the veteran people who've been in there a while are more like they're more telling us you know no no let's not do this we don't what if they come back on us and we're arguing saying well what the hell you know you're supposed to fight you're supposed to be the opposition but we need the Republicans this has to be a Republican movement independent movement which is what I originally pursued will not work because they don't have the manpower, the money, the Republicans won't get behind, you won't have the, you know, you won't have to get up or anything. But I think we should push really hard to get every independent that we know that is a Second Amendment, doesn't want their kids to put condoms on um, bananas in, in kindergarten. We need to get those people involved as well. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a right-left <coughs> issue, the middle will kill us. We need to make it a Colorado versus California issue because that's what they're trying to do to us. Um, so, are you working?
working with, like, for instance, yeah, I've talked to Dave. Time, so you're you're not going off getting petitions already. You're, no, you're, I'm just what I'm trying to do. To. My biggest goal right now is trying to get a meeting together between all the counties. Like, and we pursued first trying to get one big meeting, all the counties to go to one. But our Senate district is mapped out so stupid that you know people from Eagle County have to drive four hours to get over here, or we'd have to drive four hours to get over to Eagle County. Sure. It's yeah. ridiculous. So what I thought is three or four different meetings, like let's say one in Peonia, one in Gunnison, one in Eagle, one in Salida, and they're all connected via video conference so we can all talk to each other because we need everybody to say, all right, we're gonna do this, we're gonna pursue it full bore, we're gonna fight, you know. Once we get Eagle County and the rest of them to say we're gonna do this as one and get behind one big banner, one big flag, you know, then we can pursue it and we'll have a good chance. Because like they said, if we all go off, when I heard that Chapey County was already doing so, I got scared when I first heard that because I thought, Oh crap, what if they're doing their own thing already? But you know, like so the you're taking a wait on that. You're, you're going slow too and methodical and okay. Yeah, well I'm doing the same thing. Yeah, we're trying to be methodical. I wanted to go, you know, guns ablaze right away too. But yeah, we all do what they're doing. Like I said, they're just terrible, god awful socialists right now. But we have to wait because if we go forward to this, like I said, they're gonna fight us legally with millions and millions of dollars to try and keep this, you know, under wrap. They're already spending, I don't know if you've seen this advertisement that some guy who works for Jared Polis put up, but it is really well made. I shared it on Facebook. It's, uh, they're already fighting the recall. They're saying how ridiculous the Republican Party in the state is, you know, but like, they're already fighting it, and they, we haven't even started yet, and they're already fighting it. They're better into it, too, so I'm gonna fight. Guys, I'm gonna, I know this is a lot, I'm gonna post the PDF of this in the video oh, in the awesome. Facebook event. Great. Be judicious. About what you do with those, obviously. <laughs> what Facebook is that? Oh, um, so if you go, you, if you're on Facebook, you can go to my Facebook page. Or did I make you a host too, Dave, or Melissa? I'm a host. Oh, yeah. One. yeah, you can go to my Facebook page. The event is on there, or Melissa's a host, and she shared it as well. You have to go into the event. I'm going to post both okay. those files inside there, uh, so that you can get to them. Great. But so I, I just want to expand a little bit on what this guy is saying there. As soon as, as soon as Independence Fast opens. This district gets a lot easier to drive to. Yeah, that's right. and, and that's when we're talking about getting together all the chairs and everything. So Memorial right Day. Opens. Exactly. Because right now you got to go five hours all the way around to get anywhere. But once Independence Pass opens up, then somewhere like Aspen is very doable for everybody. And that's kind of what we're focusing on. Okay? Um, anyway, I don't know if anybody has any other questions for Melissa. She's driving on this. I'd like to have some problems. You're right, and that's, okay. is that right? Yeah. All right, I'm, I asked, uh, I talked to Rick a little bit, and I'm really interested in your way as to say. Okay, who's, who's this guy? I'm Rick Shelball. Oh, in this, you're Rick. I'm in the southern, <laughs> southernmost point of uh, Chapey County. Okay. I'm here tonight to find out how many folks here have an interest. We have three county commissioners. Hey, Rick, can you stand over there, please? Yeah. Thanks. That's better, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many folks, a show of hands, are interested in recalling just two county commissioners, Keith Baker and Greg Fell? Show of hands. And thank you. And how many folks are interested in recalling all of our county commissioners? Thank you. I know that's a simple question, but it's important to me. Okay. Thank you. So I'm afraid to recall all three. I am too. I want at least one person that we've got a little bit of continuity with. And I think that's right. <laughs> Thank you. you. I couldn't have said it better. Um, that's my interest, too. I, I, I wanted to make sure. I wanted a gut feeling on, on, on what what people were, were feeling. And, and you answered that question. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you. Just one last thing. Strategically, if you look at this county, the person that is most electable in this county at this point is a right-leaning independent, unaffiliated. Because you don't want this to be a Democrat versus Republican thing in J.P. County. So if you happen to know somebody that's really good at this, they're unaffiliated, they're right-leaning, that's exactly the person we're looking for. But they don't have, they can switch to independent at any time, correct? I think it has to be your affiliation as of January 1st. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to.